Now I'd like to talk about um, chemical trends, and one of the most important that we talk about are trends on what is called an AFM diagram. I've mentioned before there's a metamorphic AFM diagram and an igneous AFM diagram. This is an igneous AFM diagram. So A over here is sodium plus potassium. This is in weight percent. M is MgO. And F up here is combination of FeO plus 0 0.9 times Fe2O3 in weight percent. We'll talk about this in, um, in a class exercise. Um, an interesting phenomenon is that when we look at um, chemical trends on these sorts of diagrams, um, most basalts start out over here. doesn't matter if they are mid-ocean ridge basalts or, um, or uh, arc basalts. Uh, they, they tend to be in, in this region. And we'll see this um, in class, but mid-ocean ridge basalts tend to follow an iron enrichment trend. That's what this thing is, iron enrichment trend, that, that draws them up and then down again. And we'll talk about why that, that is in our uh, class discussion. You don't see that in, in, um, in arc volcanoes, especially continental arc volcanoes. You don't see the iron enrichment trend. The compositions of the magmas just trend straight away from the original composition over here um, and end up with rhyolites basically at the same point where the, the, the iron enrichment trend ends up, but they get there by a different mechanism. Clearly, something else is crystallizing from these magmas to drive the composition in this direction compared to the more typical uh, mid-ocean ridge basalts. And we'll have to think about why that might be. Um, we call, oh, sorry, we call this the calc alkaline trend. Um, and uh, it is, I don't know why it's called calc alkaline, because it has calcium, aluminum, sodium, potassium trend. Um, they do start out with higher aluminum contents, um, and so they're sometimes called high alumina basalts. So what is it that causes these differences? Well, if you um, look at what is fractionating or what is crystallizing, if I'm driving, this is also called the tholeitic trend up here, iron enrichment trend. If I am driving compositions up in this direction, I have to be losing material with the composition that's down here. And so what is that material likely to be? High in magnesium low in iron, very low in sodium and potassium. At some point this turns around though. This starts to precipitate something else and that something else has to have, in, in combination with our material down here, has to have a high iron content. So what would that be that has a high iron content co-precipitating with high magnesium material down here, but still doesn't have any sodium or potassium. You might think about our, um, our Harker diagrams for how to do that. Um, and uh, there are other ways to do this, right? I'm, I'm couching this in terms of start crystallizing out something fractionally crystallized, fractionally crystallized. You could, of course, mix materials, but again, that sort of presupposes that if you want to drive it in this direction, you already have a magma that got here, so how did it get there? What, in, just to cut to the chase, whatever is precipitating along this trend, the sequence of precipitation has to be different on the tholeitic trend, warb trend, than along the calcalkaline trend. In this case, if, if you're driving compositions off in this direction, by tholeid, in a tholeitic trend, because you're precipitating something down here, high magnesium, you're probably doing the same thing in a calcalkaline system. You're still precipitating that same high magnesium mineral, but now you must be co-precipitating a high iron phase up here somewhere to drive the composition directly towards the sodium plus potassium corner um, instead of looping around. And so this is how people usually interpret this, um, that the high magnesium material is olivine and pyroxene, 
the high iron material is magnetite, or it could be any oxide. Um, ilmenite uh, would also uh, would also work, and it's the combination of these two that drives the melt off in this direction. Remember that if you co-precipitate two phases here, then the liquid will be driven away from whatever the combination of phases, the, the phase abundances, um, happens to come out to be the, the average composition of what's being precipitated. So if, I, if the average were this composition, the trend would go off in this direction. That's the iron enrichment trend. If it were actually just magnetite, it would drive the compositions down in this direction. And so a combination centered around here, approximately 50-50, would drive the calc alkaline trend uh, that we see. So what do we notice about what do we notice about calc alkaline magmas? They have a lot of water in them. Uh, that's one thing. Um, Mid-ocean ridge basalts tend to have pretty low water content. But when we are able to um, infer what the original water contents were in um, arc magmas, uh, those basalts have a lot of water in them. Um, in fact, Christy Till's advisor, uh, Tim Grove, who was my undergraduate uh, geology advisor also, uh, did a lot of work in the Cascades, the Southern Cascades, and showed that this, the things are just sopping wet. Um, and these magmas also have to be more oxidized. They have a higher partial pressure of oxygen, which stabilizes oxides. So um, there are lots of different subduction zones, uh, lots of different arcs. Some of these are ocean-ocean subduction zones, like here or here or up here. Others are ocean-continent zone uh, subduction zones, like this. Um, and then here's an example of the Cascades that, of course, <laughs> close, close to home. Um, here, it's the Juan de Fuca plate that is being subducted um, beneath Western North America, and it gives rise to all of these different uh, mountains along here into southern uh, British Columbia. Um, here is the, um, the Andean uh, subduction system. And this one is, there's some really interesting things about this system. Um, the crust is different ages, so it's young up here. It's really old and thick in the middle, and it's young down here. And the dip of the slab is different. There are places where it has a steep dip. That's like in here and to some degree here and up here. But there are other places where it has a really shallow dip. And that's, that's in this area. And where, there, where it has a shallow dip, there's no volcanic arc. There's no magmatism at all. This is called, sometimes it's called flat slab subduction. So the slab comes down and either is just at a very shallow angle or it uh, skims along the bottom of the uh, continental lithosphere. And when that happens, we don't see uh, a volcanic arc. It's only when there is a significant dip to this that um, we actually see uh, magmas being produced at about 100 kilometers above the the top of the subducting slab. Um, here are some examples of um, different compositional trends on an AFM diagram for um, the Andes. So this is the northern volcanic zone, the central volcanic zone, and the southern volcanic zone. We'll be looking at the austral volcanic zone, which is actually just this part down here. And I'm not going to belabor this, only, only to say that what you find is that the magmas tend to just go straight off in, in a direction towards um, increasing uh, alkali content, decreasing iron and magnesium content. You don't see an initial um, iron-magnesium trend. And then these are just to show you the different kinds of compositions you get, basalts, basaltic andesites, and andesites, all the way up into these rhyolites up here. And then this is just to show that here's our neodymium versus strontium plot again. Um, and so Morb is up here. The mantle pretty much has a composition that's up here. 
where you have very thin crust, the northern volcanic zone and the southern volcanic zone, um, the compositions tend to be a lot closer to more. They're a lot closer to um, original mantle. Um, but when you get into the central volcanic zone that has this really thick uh, Precambrian crust, um, then you see this mixing. The Precambrian would be way down here somewhere, mixing um, isotopically. And so what you're looking at here is these are mixing arrays. They're mixing arrays between an original mantle-derived melt up here and um, continental material that's down here, or maybe, maybe even farther over to the right for strontium. And then, of course, there's um, the uh, plutonic rocks of the uh, Coast Batholith and the Idaho Batholith and the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and then, of course, the whole Andean Batholith along here. Large range of rock types, no question about it. In, in, even in the plutonic components, um, everything from a gabbro to a granite. Um, but it turns out that tonalites and granodiorites are volumetrically the most important. Um, so, uh, you know, we talk about the Sierra Nevada granites, and actually most of the Sierras is, is not granite. It's, it's mostly uh, tonalite and, and granodiorite, so it has a lot less potassium than, than a granite would. So this is the whole process by which um, we form our volcanoes, and again, just to remind you that a lot of this is like what happens to water and then what happens to the melts. And so this dehydration occurs, the right reactions occur at the right depth to infiltrate the mantle at the right temperature to produce these primary magmas. The then go up here, they differentiate, they can mix with pre-existing crust or melt pre-existing crust. They can rise to an intermediate depth because they have an intermediate density. Um, they could differentiate there, or they can erupt at that point. Um, and again, what we see dominantly in the volcanoes, the volcanic edifice, um, is um, andesite. And it seems to have just the right combination of uh, density and low viscosity to be eruptable. We often see evidence for disequilibrium in andesite. So here's another example that's either an amphibole or a pyroxene that has a reaction rim around it uh, because it's reacting with the glass, that the liquid that came in and, and, and picked it up. You can see these. this is all shot full of, of little melt inclusions and we have big crystals and little crystals that coexist. This crystal is starting to break apart and get dissolved and we see this banding um, in this feldspar crystal and so there's a twin boundary that runs through here, but, but these, this banding, people talk about what might drive it, and one possibility is it's pulses of magma that are coming in and driving changes to uh, plagioclase crystal growth rates and composition. Um, and in fact, if you look at a whole sequence of lavas that have been erupted, um, so you have some stack of lavas and you're analyzing their compositions, you can see this kind of zigzag pattern where you see more primitive, less evolved magmas that have lower potassium content and then ones that have more potassium content and then just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because there's multiple pulses of magma that are coming in and they're interacting with pre-existing magmas and pre-existing rocks. And um, so there's all of this mixing and differentiating that's, that's occurring. And every little rock here has undergone a little bit different differentiation or a little bit different magma mixing. So the last thing I want to talk about, this is, this is a little tangential, but it's so cool. Um, there are two things I'm going to talk about. One is beryllium-10 and one is boron. And beryllium-10 is like just the most amazing thing. It's produced in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays and it rains out on the Earth. There's very little of it. It has a half-life of only one and a half million years, but that half-life is long enough that beryllium-10 that's deposited on the surface of the ocean gets subducted down, gets lost from the slab in that water, gets up into the mantle, creates this partial melt, 
goes up, undergoes all these other mixing and, and uh, differentiation processes, and gets erupted out onto the surface before it has completely uh, radioactively decayed. So that whole process from the production at the surface, subducting, dewatering, getting entrained into this fluid, going into the mantle, melting, getting the melts up to the, to the crust, differentiating, mixing, all that kind of stuff, all of that has to happen within 10 million years because after that, all of the beryllium-10 has, has decayed away. And so what this tells us is um, a couple things. Beryllium-10 tells us that if we can see it, that the process has to be occurring very quickly, millions of years time scale, not tens of millions of years. Um, and it's also a, an important tracer because beryllium-10 um, is not present in mid-ocean ridge basalt or ocean island basalts or continental crust, right? It's only in the sediment, so it's a, it's a tracer of the sediment component. And that tells us sediments have to be involved in this, otherwise you can't get beryllium-10 into the system. Boron is a stable element, um, but it is high in sediments and super high in um, altered oceanic crust. Um, in Morb and um, Ocean Island basalts, it, it's, it's super low. So it's this alteration of oceanic crust that adds water to the crust, rate, right? But it also adds a lot of boron. So now this is beryllium-10 concentration to total beryllium. So this is telling you something about the speed of movement of material through the system. Zero means that it's completely equilibrated. Okay, so it's you know, something that's more than 10 million years old is going to have a, a zero beryllium-10 to beryllium ratio. And boron to beryllium is telling us about the, what other material is being mixed in here. So altered oceanic crust lives here. It doesn't have any beryllium-10, but it has a high boron concentration. And sediments live up here, well, they're actually off the top here, but sediments live up in this direction because they have moderately high boron to beryllium, unlike the mantle, but they have super high beryllium-10. And what is found is that there are these mixing lines that occur. So in Kamchatka, which is um, off the, you go the Aleutians, you keep going west and, and you hit the Soviet Union, uh, hit Russia, sorry, um, then uh, that's what the Kamchatka Peninsula is. Um, these others, Chile, you know, Chile, Aleutians, New Britain, Western Pacific, Kerr Isles, Western Pacific, Central America. You see these mixing lines that connect up um, mixtures of sediment-rich materials um, with mantle sources or oceanic material with mantle sources. Um, and like I said, the amazing thing is that you can measure beryllium-10 at all. The, um, Julie Morris, she published this, this great little Great little article here that, that talks about the beryllium-10 systematics in, um, in these continental arcs, or in these arcs. Okay, thanks.